Good evening. Welcome once again, Shiloh, to our time in the Word. I praise God for each and every one of you. Thank the Lord for your being uh, with us again as we attempt to look into the truth of God's Word and let Him speak life to our very souls. I praise God for uh, what He has done and, um, in fact, what He's doing even right now. Thank the Lord for all of you. Uh, who are part of our study time, who come uh, to be a part to uh, come along with us as we attempt to see what God is saying to us uh, in these days and to um, study his word and to ask him to direct our steps in a way that he would have us go. Um, and uh, I'm grateful to all of you and thank the Lord for what he's doing. I want to thank the members of the MAC team, our media ministry here at the church, for their commitment again to serve and uh, to do this wonderful thing that they do um, making sure that we have what we need to broadcast our study times and our services um, I praise God for each and every one of them uh, I want you to know uh, Shiloh that we are blessed with some of the most um, 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 capable people on the planet and we thank God for their willingness uh, to be a part of what the Lord is doing here. Um, I want to also thank the Lord for you, Shiloh. Um, your prayers um, have uh, been working. Um, I thank you for your uh, commitment to pray for those who are hurting in our fellowship. Uh, we have so many um, that have been going through and uh, I am so happy to be a part of a church family that um, makes the commitment to pray and to see God's face on the behalf of others. And I thank the Lord for, for each and every one of you. Um, we are in, uh, we're in some very, very difficult times, very trying times. Um, I need you to know that I miss you. Um, I miss you a whole lot. Um, you know, you never know, <clears throat> pardon me, how important uh, something is until you, you you can't have it anymore and um, um, you know you, we've been taking for years taking for granted our Sunday morning gatherings and um, you know it's just something that's going to happen and now that we have been separated for these last few months um, I miss those times I miss those times with you and uh, I'm grateful to God that we can at least um, have some form of interaction, even if it is um, what would be considered virtual uh, through the internet. God bless you and thank you so much for your your commitment. I praise God for, um, and I mean that now more than ever, for all of you. There are a couple of things that we need to just share with you, and uh, we're going to move right right along. Um, the first one is pardon me, that we are planning another outdoor gathering, all right? So it'll be Labor Day weekend, that Sunday before Labor Day. I believe that's September the 6th. And we'll be gathering here at the church at 10 a.m. We're going to have an outdoor worship, outdoor worship, all right? Uh, we want you to come and be a part like we did last month, um, Praise God for you taking it upon yourselves to do the social distancing and what have you that needed to be done. We want to encourage you to come back to our um, uh, gathering outside on September the 6th at 10 a.m. Please make contact with those persons uh, on the part of our fellowship. Let them know that we're coming together and uh, we'll be here uh, singing and worshiping God uh, one more time um, in his presence. Uh, the other thing is is that in light of some of the things that have been going on around us, um, we're going to be making some uh, definitive decisions about um, the use of our building and how we're going to proceed. I will be sharing those things with you uh, as we um, as weeks progress. Um, we're not ready to come back in the building. Uh, as a um, in terms of having in service uh, in person rather worship services, um, but uh, right now 
uh, we're going to be doing some things to uh, um, kind of protect and do what we have to do. Now, you need to know, Shiloh, that we are taking precautions around here, um, and we're going to take even more as we move forward because we want to make sure that our people um, are safe. We don't want you to come into the place and get sick. We want to make sure that everyone is, in fact, safe. So with that in mind, um, we're going to just let you know that when we do have our in-person gatherings, the ones that we're going to have, um, no matter where they are, whether it be funerals, weddings, whatever the situation is, or actual services, you need to understand that a mask is mandatory. Masks are mandatory. All right, let me say it again. Masks will be mandatory. All right, if you do not have a mask, you can't come in the building. And when you come in the building with a mask, the mask must remain on for the duration of the gathering. All right. And I understand that you got to make some adjustments. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Do that, but do not remove the mask. Take it off. Take it down. Again, as uh, our governor has said, we're not wearing chin guards. We're wearing face masks. And so we want to make sure that you have um, have that on. All right. You must have a mask on when you come. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be doing some things also um, concerning the area of uh, social distancing when we come in the building and so we're going to make some uh, decisions about that over the next few weeks and I'll be reporting those to you and preparing you for um, the potential return to our fellowship and gathering again all right so those are a couple of things you want to share with you keep those things in mind and we're going to move forward in Jesus name the Lord has not forgotten us he's still working with us and for us <clears throat> and on our behalf and we're grateful to our God for that Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for what you've done so far in our lives. We give you praise and we love you for your great love for us and for your keeping power. I thank you for every person that's under the sound of my voice. And we pray that you would bless now your word, sanctify your truth to our hearts, cause us to hear from you and to speak life to us as only you can. And we will glorify you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 139, um, we have been looking at this psalm over the last few weeks, and I don't know about you, but it's been a great blessing to me. Um, every time I read the psalm and study it, I see something else, and um, for years now, as I have moved through the psalm, and um, specifically for what it has done in my own heart and in my own life and given shape to um, who I am as a person, uh, is so rich that every time I, I come to it, God speaks a fresh uh, word and a refreshing to, uh, to my soul uh, through this psalm. Um, what we've learned so far uh, uh, from this psalm, uh, first of all, is uh, we've learned uh, what David believed. And uh, that's verses 1 to 12. And uh, we learned that David believed some things specifically about God, and uh, he lets us in on those things. In uh, the first 12 verses of Psalm 139, um, he believed, first of all, that God is omniscient, and uh, that means, of course, that God knows everything at once. And then verses 7 to 12, he believed that God is omnipresent, and that is God is everywhere present at the same time, all right? And so that's what he believed, all right? And then in verses 13 through 18, we learned why David worshipped. And, of course, um, he worships uh, in those verses because he says that um, his very existence, his very existence is due to the fact that omniscience and omnipresence converged, came together as it relates to him and, um, and his birth. <laughs> Pardon me, and of course, he's not simply saying this is only true about him, but it's also true uh, about you and I, my beloved. Um, God literally um, 
uh, knew us and formed us and shaped us inside of the womb. And David literally says to us that um, his very being um, is due to God's work. And as a result of that, he says, my very being is enough for me to worship God. Um, in other words, if he doesn't do anything else, he's done enough already. My very being, my, my very existence is due to the very, uh, very good hand of of, of the living God. And so he says, I worship him and I praise him. Now, what's interesting about these first 18 verses, beloved, is that God, as David moves through these, um, moves through these sections, as he moves through these verses and he's dealing with them, um, he moves uh, very smoothly um, from explanation to application to exaltation. Right? So, he, he spent some time explaining, um, he explains some things about God, that is what he knows, and then he makes application of what he knows about God. Um, you know, you know my thoughts, you are omniscient, you know my thoughts um, before they come to me, uh, the words that I speak, you know them before I speak them. Um, 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 I'm the presence, he says, wherever I go, you, you're there application and then he and then he slips into exaltation right he begins to thank God and bless him um, verse 6 he says uh, the, the knowledge of this knowledge is too much for me I can't it's too much for me to even to even try and comprehend It's beyond my ability to get a hold of and then of course in verse 14 he says I will I will praise you um, for I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made so uh, David moves evenly and smoothly between those three ideas and um, he literally helps us understand some things because what he does is he says um, um, every believer should know their doctrine should should know doctrine because doctrine is what's going to propel you uh, it's going to help you in the area of your um, of your worship right so here's what he says. Um, he says, I know this about God. This is who God is. Right? And then he says, um, I, I, I know what God has done and what God is doing. Right? That'd be application. Right? And then he says, thirdly, I'm going to celebrate God for who he is and what he's done. You see what I'm saying? So that the idea becomes, I, we don't, as believers, we don't need a whole lot of stuff um, for us to understand the necessity and importance of worshiping God, right? We know who he is. We know what he's done. That's secondly. And then thirdly, we then celebrate him for who he is and for what he's done. So doctrine is important to us because doctrine leads us. It becomes uh, the uh, the source from which we draw our our worship, our our worship of of the living God. And so David says that's important. That's why he begins here, and I'm so happy he does with doctrine. He lays out the very truth um, about God. Now we've studied and we talked about what David believes. And we've talked about why David worshipped. But beginning in verse 19, David moves into this third area, which is, for us, how David lived. How David lived. And so let me just take a time, take a minute here and, and work on, uh, work with this a little bit. He says, he says um, this is what I believe, verses 1 to 12. This is why I worship, verses 13 through 18. And then he says, this is how I live. And that's beginning at um, verse 19. Now, in dealing with this section, it is important to remember that what David is doing, in beginning in verse 19, as a result of what he knows about God, okay, beginning there, 
and growing out of that knowledge of God and his act of worship that's connected to that, right? David, in verses 19 through 24, aligns himself with God. He aligns himself with God. Now, <clears throat> what we mean, and what I'm trying to get you to understand, all right, is this. That David puts himself in a position where he takes God's side in the midst of the moment that he's in. Stay with me. He demonstrates for us the importance of aligning ourselves with God in life's situations. Now, we don't know specifically, as I said to you so many times over the last few weeks, we really don't know what's happening with David at the time. We don't know what uh, creates the need for him to write this psalm, um, we don't know, as if, for instance, Psalm 51, we know that one. Psalm 34, we know that one. But this particular psalm does not give us any historical setting for us to work with. Although we know for certain that it does come out of some historical context in David's life. Which one, we don't know, right? But based on verses 19 through 22, more than likely, it is a circumstances where David's enemies are falsely accusing him and they are maligning his God. In other words, they are they're talking about David, they're lying on David, and they're also literally saying some negative things about God. Okay? All right, so and we and we essentially get that from verses 19 and 22. We don't know that for sure, but there is a strong possibility because of David's history and because of what we know about him, we know that he was always surrounded by someone that didn't like him. We know that. All right? And um, as a result of that, there are oftentimes when David's enemies would become will come to the forefront and begin to lay uh, lay accusations at him, come at him, and what have you. And David finds himself in desperate need of help from God. Right. So we assume that that's what's happening here in this in this song. Right. But here's the deal. David aligns himself in this situation that he's going through. The moment that he's in, he aligns himself with God. That's important. And you got to understand it. Here's the deal. David is literally saying, he's literally saying, I need God in this situation that I'm in. And I need him so much, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take his side in my situation. I'm going to stand where he stands in this. That's a powerful statement. Because under normal circumstances, what we want is we want God to come and stand on our side. Now, the beginning of the verse, the beginning rather of the section, verse 19, literally David is, is simply saying to God what will be the, the normal human position. All right, and that is get them. But then the rest of the section, David lays himself before God and says, it's almost as if he's saying, I'm going to do this this way. No matter what you do, Lord, I'm going to do this this way. I'm going to approach this this way. And the reason is, is because 
David has concluded that God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, and God has his life in his hands. And as a result of that, David is saying, this is the God I need in the moment that I'm in. I need this God right here, this omniscient, omnipresent, this one who's watched over me and kept me and protected me even before I knew who I was. He was there. That's the God that I need in the moment that I'm in. So he says, I'm going to literally align myself with him. Now the question becomes, how does he do that? Three ways. Psalm 139, beginning at verse 19, at least three ways. First of all, supplication. Secondly, separation. And then thirdly, submission. Stay with me, beloved. We're going somewhere. First of all, supplication. David prays and asks God to do something specifically. He says, surely thou will slay the wicked, O God. That is the normal response, the normal human response when faced with opposition and enemies that are affecting you, hurting you. It's the normal human response. He says, get them, God. Get them. And the, and the fact of the matter is, is that he raises the question, it raises rather this issue because he knows God can. And historically, if this is a psalm that's written later in his life, he's seen God act on, 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 um, on his behalf and he's seen God deal with his enemies. And so he, he literally brings into, he says, look, Lord, here's what you do. Get him. Lay them out. All you have to do is speak a word, and it's all over. They're done. Get them, God. Um, he supplicates. Now, as to whether or not this is uh, something that is, um, uh, you know, what would be considered the right kind of prayer to pray about your enemies, whether that's the thing, I don't really think that that's really the issue here. Um, the issue that I believe that the Word of God, because this is more than one uh, time that he's done this. He's done it on a number of occasions throughout the Psalms. He's talked about dashing their children and on the stones and slaying the multitude of their wives and daughters, etc. He's done a whole lot of that in here. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that what the Lord wants us to understand is that the people... In the scripture, the ones that we admire and exalt are human just like us. They're just like we are. They were no better than we are, and God used them. See, they had some of the same impulses, the same interests, the same desires. They had some of the same failures and had the same faults that you and I have, and they're just like us. And God wants us to be clear on that. That's why he exposes them to us and for us so that we can see them and not walk around beat up every time something goes wrong in our lives. He wants us to understand that he uses regular people, everyday common people. And uh, that's the reason why it's important that we get a hold of this. So he begins his alignment. He begins aligning himself with God with supplication. But then he doesn't stop there. He moves to separation. Here's what he says. Depart from me. Same verse, verse 19. Depart from me, you bloody, depart from me rather, therefore, you bloody men. Right? Here's what's happening. He does a couple of things. First thing he says is, I'm going to align myself with God by separating. And here's what he says. I'm going to depart. Watch. He says, for they speak against you wickedly, and thine enemies take your name in vain. He, literally what he's saying is, is that I don't want to be identified with that crowd. I don't want to be identified with them, therefore I don't want them around me. I don't want to be connected to them in any way, 
shape or form I want to be different I want to be different and that difference pardon me is literally seen in what he does next and that is he makes a decision he makes a decision here's what he says do not verse 21 I hate them O Lord that hate thee and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee verse 22 I hate them with perfect hatred I count them my enemies beloved David makes a decision a conscious decision that he is literally going to be separate from the rest of the people who are walking around saying evil and mean things and bad things about God. He will not be identified with that crowd. In other words, here's what David says. David literally says, I am going to take action on this issue in terms of aligning myself with God. Yes, I want him to deal with them. Yes, I want God to say something to my enemy. Yes, it, I would prefer that God would shut them down. But the reality is, if he doesn't do it, if he doesn't do it, what I'm going to do is equally important. And that is, I'm going to make sure that I stand where he is. Here's the idea. He says, I have enough information about him. I have enough information about my God to go where he is. I have enough information. I know enough about him to go and stand where he is. And I'm going to go and stand where he is in spite of what others are doing around me because I don't want to be identified with them. I am aligning myself with the God of heaven so he makes a decision he supplicates he separate he, he separates but then thirdly he submits is verse 23 verse 24 in my humble opinion two of the most powerful um, verses in all the Bible um, particularly as it relates to its application. Look at this. David says in verses 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Let's do it again. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. These two verses are so important and so powerful that um, I want to spend a little time digging them up a little bit. Um, and I don't have an outline as such. I just want to, I just want to talk to you. Um, I believe this psalm is written, and this is personal, um, I have absolutely no scholarship on this whatsoever, I don't, you know, I haven't heard or said any, heard anyone else talk about this this way, um, but this is my own personal conviction based on my study and reading uh, of the psalm. Um, I believe that this psalm is written in the latter years of David's life. I, again, I have no, I have no proof of that, no evidence, evidence of that at all. But I believe it's written in the latter years of his life because what David is doing in verses 23 and 24 requires a level of maturity that most people don't have in their youth. Um, I do not believe that this is David the Shepherd talking. I believe it's David the King. And I believe that it's David 
the king well into his reign because the level of maturity required to quote verses 23 and 24 you don't have normally in your youth what's happening in these verses literally is David has come to terms with the sovereignty of God and he is consciously now submitting to that sovereignty. Now, I am not suggesting that David did not know God was sovereign before now. He knew it. But there's evidence in his life that he had not yet come to terms with the reality of God's sovereignty. And I want to submit to you, beloved, that coming to terms with sovereignty is a whole lot different than knowing that God is sovereign. When you come to terms with the reality of God's sovereignty, you begin to come to terms with the fact that, number one, you can't get away from that. Number two, sovereignty is God's right as God. And number three, that sovereignty is not your enemy. The fact that God is sovereign does not mean that there is something against you and I. It's, it's, not, it's not working against us. He's not He's not standing in opposition to us. Sovereignty is not our enemy. Sovereignty, when understood and, and correctly embraced, sovereignty is always for our good. Sovereignty is never against us. It's not something that God uses to throw our lives off. Sovereignty is literally in, set in motion for us to put our lives on, on course so that we end up aligning ourselves with the God who made us. Listen to this. One of the best illustrations of the, of the dynamic truth of God's sovereignty is seen in the creation and development of Adam. Okay? Check this. God makes Adam in the latter half, if you will, of the sixth day. Okay? He makes Adam in the latter half of the sixth day. When Adam is finally created, everything 
that he would need for his survival is already present. Listen. And everything that he needs for his survival is already present by a sovereign act of God. He intentionally did not make Adam until everything that Adam needed was made first. Wait, with the exception of one thing, only one. After he makes Adam, and Adam begins to move through the garden and do what he needs to do as an obedience, as obedient, in obedience rather to the God of heaven, as he does that, it becomes apparent to him that there's no one else in the garden just like him. God then announced, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper that's fit for him. And so, sovereign choice. And so, what God then does is he puts Adam to sleep as an act of his own sovereign will and takes something out of Adam that's already made, already created, and creates a helper for Adam that's designed specifically for Adam in the garden, watch, and then gives to Adam what he stands in need of and brings them together by sovereign choice. Here's my point, beloved. All of that, that, that all of that run around there, what's for one, what I'm trying to get you to understand is this, is that the entire creating of create, creative process, everything takes place there, in that, during that six-day period, everything that's done there, literally, everything that's done is done as an act of God's sovereignty, and all of it is for the benefit of man. All of it. Every single sovereign choice is for man's benefit. Now, stay with me. David comes to terms with that. Just like you and I have got to come to terms with it in our lives. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to drag this out and make it long. I'm really trying to get you to understand this. Here's what David says. In verse 23, he says, search me, O God. The point he's making is this. Stay with me. Now, he's already said in verse 1, Lord, you have searched me. No, he knows he's searching him. He already knows that he knows him. He knows that. What he's doing now in verses 23 and 24, because he's aligning himself with God, he's literally saying to the Lord, okay, God, I surrender. I surrender. I finally get it. I understand. I literally am aware of the fact, theoretically, in terms of my head, I knew that you searched me already. I knew that you knew me already. I knew you knew my thoughts and all that stuff. I get all of that. I got all of that, rather. But here's the deal. Finally, my heart has landed where my head has already been. And that is, I am making myself freely, I, I open myself up now to your search, do whatever you want to do now. Search me. Know my thoughts. And see if there's any wicked way. In other words, if there's anything in me that needs to be corrected, God, do it. Correct me. Because I don't want to stay the way that I am. 
I want to be different. And you've got the power to change me. And so I surrender to you and say, Lord, change me. Do whatever you want to do. I'm yours, Lord. Everything I am, I'm yours. God bless you, Shiloh. I love you and I appreciate you so very, very, very much. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. I pray your blessing upon this, the word, in the hearts of the hearers. I ask that you would give us what we stand in need of. And we will glorify you and bless you forever. For you alone are worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, my beloved. I, I, I love and appreciate you so very, very much. Um, let us not forget uh, that we are still uh, requesting that you would do uh, your part in uh, making contributions, your tithes, your offerings. Continue to do that. You've done so well over the last few uh, months, and I thank the Lord for each and every one of you. We're praying that God restores to each of you what you have given, your sacrifices, and we thank the Lord for all of you. Now, Please don't forget Cash App online. Call the church office. We'll be happy to send someone, or you can drop it off yourself. And make arrangements to do that. We're so, so blessed of God that you are fulfilling your responsibilities. Continue to do that, and we will glorify God for you and continue to pray. 7 a.m. Saturday morning is our uh, weekly prayer call. We invite you to come uh, join uh, us at our prayer gathering on Saturday mornings at 7. The Lord's doing some wonderful things there, and we encourage you to come and be a part. God bless you, Shiloh. I love you and appreciate you. Bye-bye.